Okay, so I hope everybody can hear me. Then le let's get started. So I'm uh, Hugo Messer. I have been working with India for 10 or 12 years now. So I've got a lot of experience uh, on working with distributed teams and distributed agile. So my talk today will be about the top five problems that I've actually en encountered myself and that I've seen other people struggle with if we work with distributed agile teams. Yeah? First question I often get is, what do you mean by distributed? Yeah? So we can make a whole theoretical approach showing these quadrants. This is from Johanna Rodman, and she takes the 60 meters approach. So she says, okay, if you're in one building or like in one city and we've got two buildings, then you might call it distributed. Yeah. My, my, my answer to a distributed or the way I see distributed is when we have people in other countries, like we have other time zones, other cultures. Uh, so when I talk about distributed, that is, that is what I'm referring to. Because I think if you're in the same country, in the same city, you can still meet up, you're talking the same language, and it's a lot easier to organize stuff to collaborate, co-locate it. But if you have India, Holland, for example, it's a lot more complicated. Yeah? So that's my perspective here. So I'll walk you through my own personal story and the five problems as I have distilled them over the last, you know, let's say 10 or 12 years. I'll share some things that helped me because there is no magic bullet. I don't think there is any framework or model like Scrum, okay, do this for Agile or for distributed teams and it will work. Unfortunately, it's not there and I think it will never be invented. I'll share some tools that you might be able to use in your own uh, practice, and then I'll wrap up. I've got about 20 minutes, which is pretty short. Normally I have longer, but let's see what we get. So this is my country. I'm from Holland, and you know, no, there's not so many places where it looks like this. A lot of people think we walk in wooden shoes and we have a lot of windmills. There are some places where it looks like this, but often it's very gray sky. It rains a lot. We've got a lot of wind. So last year I decided to replace my environment and I now live in Bali. So it's, I, I took it from the internet, but it looks somewhat like this. In 2004, I made a trip to India and I had already in my mind to start an outsourcing company because in that period, all the US companies started outsourcing to India and I figured that Europe usually is two or three years later than the US. So if the Americans were doing it, I thought the Dutch or the Europeans would start doing the same thing. Is it funny? <laughs> and it was actually about right, uh, because ri right now there's a lot of Dutch companies doing outsourcing and it's very common. Shell is there, a lot of uh, ING Bank will have a talk tomorrow. So this is me in the Rajasthan desert thinking about how I would you know, start a company around this model. Like, what could I do? I had no experience. I didn't know anything about software. I didn't have any contacts. Uh, so that desert helped me a lot. And when I came back, I started Bridge Global. Uh, initially, I was an intermediary, so I took projects from companies in Holland and then outsourced that to suppliers in Ukraine. Yeah, I chose Ukraine because I thought it would be closer by. Yeah, culturally, geographically, time difference is only one hour. And I also learned that if I work with it, I, I spent like, three months in India traveling around, and I figured that it would be very challenging to work with a culture that is so different from what we're used to, at least in my perspective, in Holland. Um, I, I see that differently right now because I actually believe you can work with any culture. It just takes a little bit of time and practice. So that company, I started as an intermediary, and now, right now we have own offices in Ukraine and India. Most of, the, most of my people are in India now. In that first period from 2005 to 10, I cried many times because I think I must have made all the mistakes that you could possibly make in that situation because I didn't know anything about IT outsourcing didn't know about software development. Everything was still waterfall in that period. So some of the things that I encountered. So what I first did is I thought, okay, if I put a project manager in between my client and my Ukraine teams or my Indian teams, she could actually solve everything yeah? because she speaks the same language. She can go out for lunch with my clients and everything will work out fine. So she, she took like the re big requirements documents from my clients send that to my teams in Ukraine, and then they made an estimate, they made a planning, a proposal, etc. all fine. And then she was managing it. Now, my, you know, it's not a scientific thing, but I think 80% of the projects in such model work okay, yeah? and then 10%, you know, you have a lot of pain and you finish it, but the last 10% brings you to a courtroom somewhere, yeah? because you can't finish it. 
So early on, I concluded, okay, fixed price, waterfall-based projects is not really the way to go. So the first generic thing that I see, and is it, this is true for a fixed price waterfall project, and it is still there if you do agile, the teams are often in the dark. Yeah? So you get your big requirements documents, which is made by some brain somewhere in, let's say, the US, and that brain puts it into a document and sends it to India. And in India, some other brains are going to look at this and try to understand what that guy has in mind. But it's not easy, yeah, because we have to read everything, and we don't know if he wrote down the right things. As a team remotely, we also don't know what the product is about. We don't talk to the users, we're not close to the stakeholders. We might be, like if it's an insurance product, we might have a totally different system in India versus the US, so we don't understand the domain or the context. Yeah? So that brings that team kind of in the dark. The second thing is, if you look at it from the client perspective or the outsourcer perspective onshore, it's sort of a black box. So I take my requirements, I send that into that black box. Some smart people that do work in their ways, you know, they organize and they make the work happen, but I've got no idea who is working on those projects or how they are doing the work. Yeah? So I'm relying on that black box. Yeah? Ideally, I want to open that black box, which Agile does, yeah, because we have way more interaction. We don't make the big requirements documents. So that helps a lot. But in a lot of cases, you know, people don't dare to go into the airplane, and they still sit far away, and they see India as a black box. So I think this is still a big problem. So when I learned that, I thought, OK, let's do it in another way. So I hired these guys, and I made them work for my, my client in a dedicated team. Yeah. They were not so good yet, by the way. So. I figured, okay, if I have a product client, a product that we're building a product for a client, be it a product company or an enterprise building their own product, and I've got a dedicated team continuously working for that product on the longer term, it would work a lot better. And it actually does, because you get more of a partnership or a sense of being one team. Huh? So I think this model is a lot better than using this black box waterfall approach. The issue that I had personally in that case was I was an intermediary at that moment, so the clients were working with my suppliers, and of course I brought them to the best suppliers in Ukraine, but after three months they would come knock on my door and they said, you brought me to these great guys, but you're actually not adding value. So we decided to work directly, so from next month we won't pay you again. I thought, okay, that's not nice. So I went to India uh, in 2008 with my family, I, I don't wear this regularly, but in Kerala, where our office is, they wear this. And this was a wedding of one of my colleagues. And this is my wife and two kids in that period. Um, and I went to India for one and a half year to set up our office. And at the same time, so I did this completely from scratch, you know, hired people and found an office, which I don't advise to do like that because it's not that easy. And I also started partnerships in Ukraine and Moldova. So I set up joint ventures with companies that I had worked with before. And in this case, I, I had more control over who was working for me, and my clients perceived everything as being bridge. Yeah? So they didn't go behind my back because they couldn't. Uh, they could still program us, but most people don't react to that, I found. Now, this didn't solve all the issues, because one of the things that you have if you make a client work or an onshore team work directly with an offshore team are the cultural differences. I don't want to explain too much about this, but one of the things people in India tend to do is throw colors at each other, so that's something we're not used to in the West. You're also used a lot to hierarchy. Yeah? The society in India is much more hierarchical, so people are used to getting orders from bosses or from teachers or from dads. Yeah? Where they ho the whole system is different. And if I'm a Dutch, and in Holland we try to organize everything in a very flat way. Yeah? So if you make a Dutch work with an Indian team, they have to get used to that. Because yeah, it requires a different way of organizing, especially if you do Agile. We, we rely on people not waiting for instructions. We want people to be proactive and take their own responsibility. Yeah? So you need to educate and train people on, the Indian side, on both sides, by the way, to get to that level. Yeah? Another thing I notice is that openness is a big issue. Now, we Dutch are very famous to be a little bit too open sometimes, yeah? to the extent of being blunt. <laughs> I've learned that this is not always the right approach because you might insult people and they will still smile, yeah? but still, you might have insulted them. So 
I learned that uh, being open is, is actually good. This is one of the core values in our company as well. But it takes time to get people to that level. Yeah? And if you get people to understand what openness can bring, it's also one of the core values of Scrum. If people are open about being stuck or not understanding something, it makes it easier to collaborate with other cultures. Yeah? But still, it takes time and you need to work on that. The fourth thing I found is that you often get a us versus them mentality. So if we're in the US and we outsource to those guys over there in India, then if something goes wrong, those Indians did it wrong. That's what, what tends to happen. Sounds familiar, I think? So as soon as that happens, you, try, you get a separate, yeah? you, get, you get a big divide and the relationship, be it within one enterprise or client vendor, it drives things apart. Yeah? Whereas you want to be partner, you want, to be, you want everything to be one. So if I notice this within the collaboration with one of our clients, it's a big red flag. And I know I have to start working on the mindset and the way we collaborate. Right? Because you can't fix this in a contract. Fifth thing is, and this is surprising, we stop communicating. Right? If we're in one office, we meet each other very regularly. We have lunch, we have coffee, we have all our roadmaps and product visions on the wall and everybody can see this. But our remote teams can't see that. Uh, and we don't, we don't meet regularly. So even though we have Skype, we have WhatsApp, we have Slack, there's a lot of ways to communicate. People tend to, to communicate less than if they're in the same office, whereas they need to communicate more. Yeah? And I think this is a very big thing. Be it's very easy to just put up a screen and have a continuous video conference with your team in India, but I don't see many companies do that. A few weeks back, I was in a big bank in Jakarta, and I see they work with you know, Hungary, Jakarta, which doesn't make sense to me, but they do. And then they have Skype calls with 15 people on the Jakarta side, and then two teams in Hungary, all through Skype connection with a small screen like this, and everybody, everybody is asking, you, okay, can you hear me, can you hear me? And I think it's 2017, why do we do this? Yeah, so I think this is a major thing, and even with all the money and communication models, we're still not doing this. Yeah? We're not communicating. So in the years after that, 2010 to 15, I started learning a lot on how, what not to do, how to avoid these issues. So my company started growing. I learned, I learned a lot myself. And one of the things we did in 2011 or 12, I believe, is to start with Scrum. Yeah? I hear a lot of, you know, feed uh, negative things about Scrum, about the certification, especially in this conference. And I think in a way, I, I understand why, but I also think this actually brings a lot of value wor worldwide. I mean, Microsoft made standards for PCs. Yeah? Everybody thinks Microsoft is bad, but they actually enabled us to have one platform to communicate through a system. If they hadn't been there, where would we be today? So I think Scrum is doing somewhat similar. You know, Everybody worldwide, understand Scrum, it's easy to learn, it's easy to start with, and that helps companies to collaborate. So, and also the you know, meeting rhythm that you have within Scrum helps so much if you have people in different locations. You know? The other thing is self-organization. For me, that has been an eye-opener because, again, if in India, it's very common to be hierarchical. Yeah? And we are, like a lot of Western people, assume that Indians cannot self-organize. Yeah? They're, they're the people who make the code, yeah? and we have to give them instructions, and then they'll do it. But I believe if you use Agile and you bring more authority and power to Indian teams, people will really, you know, they, they will grow, they will take more responsibility, and they will work you know, using their brains to bring more value to your projects. Yeah? So I think the self-organization is one of the keys to make distributed teams work better. Yeah? And you have a lot of different models in that. I think if you, if you look at Scrum, if you work with Scrum, I think product owner onshore and then the full team self-organized in India is one of the easiest way or the best ways to organize. And if you have everything distributed, so you have teams with split between three locations, it's a lot harder to make that team self-organized. Another thing I believe is that the Scrum Master is really the glue in any collaboration. Yeah? Because the Scrum Master can actually re recognize what's going on in a collaboration onshore, offshore. Yeah? They can find, okay, if, if the client or the product owner is not communicating requirements well, he could start talking to the product owner to find that that's actually in Scrum, that's what a Scrum Master is supposed to do. 
but if it's a remote team, I think his role is even more important. Now, he can train his people to communicate better if he recognizes that the communication between the two sides is not working well. In our company, one of the roles that we have added to this is the process manager. And that person is actually somebody who is outside the team. So she's not really in the details of a project, but she's only responsible for the collaboration between the client and the remote teams. And she's looking at things. So every week she does a Skype call with the client or the product owner and sees you know, how, how is the collaboration going. She even has a, a metric on a scale of 1 to 10. Like this week, what do you think about the collaboration on a scale of 1 to 10? And it's a very easy metric, but it keeps your finger on the pulse. You, know, you see what's going on. And if one week it's an 8 and then it's a 5, you know you have to change something. Another thing that I see, like the number one thing remote teams complain about is my product owner is not available. And I think the issue there is that product owners are often the most busy people in a company. So they run around, they have to talk to clients and stakeholders, and they don't have the time to, sp to spend with their remote teams. Whereas if you're remote, you can't just, you know, in, in, Scrum says, okay, co-locate everyone. And so if I'm, as a developer, during the sprint, I've got a question, I can just turn around and then walk to my product owner and ask for clarification. Yeah. Now, in a remote setting, you want to simulate that at least. So that if, as a developer, I have a question, I can get the answer within a reasonable amount of time so I don't get stuck for two days yeah, and then get blamed for my delay. So I think we need to get engaged product owners that also have a lot of time. And... One of the things that I see in a lot of companies work is to have a proxy product owner. Uh, it's, you know, if you look at sh pure Scrum, then people would say it's not allowed. Uh, but I think it helps a lot because if the proxy product, so there would be a sort of secondary product owner in the remote team who gets authority from the product owner to make decisions. Uh, so if this developer has a question, he can actually go to that person. And in 90% of the cases, he should be able to say, okay, this is the, this is the explanation. And that requires trust between the product owner and the proxy product owner. It takes time. But if you have that role solidly, then I think this collaboration is going to work a lot better. Some tools that I have used. One is scaling up. And this is actually a method that is not agile as far as I... I think it's agile, but it's not spoken about on conferences like this. It's, it's actually Before it was called the Rockefeller Habits. And this is more to help companies grow. Uh, it's written by an American guy, Vern Arnish. And the logic is you've got a one-page one strategic plan. And now, this, has a, this is basically a complete overview of your company's roadmap. So you have your core values, your, your mission, your vision on this side, and then it goes to three to five years plans, one-year plans, quarterly, weekly, and daily. So this is a, a blueprint. And you can use this also on the business unit or department level or uh, enterprise level. And linked to this, you have a communication rhythm of yearly, quarterly, monthly, weekly, and daily meetings. And the weekly rhythm is actually similar to Agile. So you have you work in weekly sprints. You've got your daily stand-up with the management team. And it, it has helped me a lot to create alignment among my different locations. Um, yeah, that's a one-page strategic plan. Another, another tool that I have developed is the distributed team canvas. Now, the way to use this is on the, this works on the team level. So if you have a team that is struggling with collaborating, you can use this to streamline them and to have you know, action plans to improve what goes wrong. So there are eight building blocks, and each of those blocks is an important element in working distributed. So you could actually put the teams in one room, give them a lot of sticky notes, put this on the wall, and then do a workshop around this. So for example, you can have the team discuss, okay, what kind of cultural things do, like intercultural issues do we have that disrupt our work and what kind of actions do we plan to circumvent them or to work around them. Now what kind of responsibilities do we put on onshore versus offshore? Uh, now we have the product owner far away, what challenges does that bring and how can we improve it? Maybe we can add a proxy product owner. What, what kind of tools do we use for the knowledge transfer? How do we make sure that everybody understands the product vision, the roadmap, etc.? So you can map that all out. If you're interested, I've got a PDF with instructions on how to do this, so I can send that to you. Another thing I developed is a culture canvas. And the way this works is you've got some perspectives below here. So you, if, I'm, if I'm a Dutch and I'm working with an Indian team, 
I will feel this about my Indian team, and they will do this about me. Yeah? So for example, if I'm Dutch and I, I reflect on the collaboration with my Indian colleagues, I will say, okay, proactivity is one of the perspectives. So I expect my people and my team to be proactive. And in my experience, working with, this is just an example, it's not true. Uh, in my experience working with Indian people, I found that they are not proactive enough, so I would like them to open up a bit more so they can share their smart ideas and we improve our team and our product. Yeah? So I'll stick this. And then I might say, okay, some of my colleagues in Holland are actually saying, okay, the quality, the quality of the code is not good enough. So people tend to make codes, and then they just give it and say, I'm ready. Nobody tests his work. That doesn't happen in India, but I might say that. Yeah? And then as an Indian, as the Indian team, I'll do the same about the Dutch. So maybe again, I, I'm, I, they will say, okay, this guy is very nice, but he's too open sometimes, and we get insulted, and this kind of demotivates the team. So the team spirit is not good enough, stuff like that. And then when you have those two perspectives, you can make a top five of issues that you recognize which disrupt the teamwork, and then you know, come with actions on how to go about solving them. So it's a very simple tool, but I think this creates clarity or awareness about the cultural differences and how this influences the work. Because in a lot of teams I see everybody agrees, okay, there are cultural differences, but nobody really does anything about it. Uh, cultural training maybe, but I'm not sure if that brings you anywhere, because I think it's all about action. You need to start doing some stuff. Yeah. So as a wrap up, create an agile culture, because I really believe agile helps distributed work. Yeah. Traditional models don't work. Agile creates a spirit of improvement, and this makes it much easier to make such distributed teams work. Try to get some empathic scrum masters, because I think empathy is key. You want to have, ideally, you want to have women in that role, I believe. That's my personal perspective. You don't want to have a you know, introver completely introverted, data-oriented guy who prefers talking to his PC instead of people. So I think that helps. You want to have engaged product owners who have time to really answer the important questions of your teams. And you want to keep the monkey where it belongs. So if somebody has a monkey or a problem on his shoulder, you want them to fix it. Instead of saying, okay, please take my monkey and you fix this for me. I wrote six books about this topic, so if you're interested, you could download them here. It's on my Indonesian website because I started an agile transformation and training company in Indonesia. Uh, so it's akipa.co ID and then ebooks. I, I will, the, share, the slides will be there so you can find this easily. And these are my contacts. So if you want to get in touch or get, uh, if you want, I can send you the PDF with the distributed team canvas and the slides, just drop me an email. I think we have some, uh, what do we have? 12.52. So we have maybe 10 minutes to do some Q&A, but I think it's lunchtime. So if you want to go out for lunch, just go. And if you want to ask some questions, feel free. And thanks for listening. Are there any questions? Uh, thanks. No questions? Then, yeah? Maybe let's take it off because everybody is leaving. We'll do it in the lunch break. Oh, we have time. Yeah? No, we are, we are actually running out of time, but uh, okay. it's okay. Since okay. it is lunch break, we can. Okay. Let's try. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is Raghu here. I'm from uh, ANZ Bank. Right, so we have a technology office here in India, yep. Bangalore. Um, so one of the challenges is uh, we sort of, uh, I mean, Agile is not new to the bank, so we've been following these practices for a while, but uh, we sort of uh, um, looking at establishing something for a, a particular department. Okay. And uh, so currently this team is spread across different, um, you know, Australia, um, so, so in, even in Australia, we have Sydney, Melbourne, right. and we have Manila, people in Manila. My colleagues said the same thing. Okay, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so, yeah, go on. Yeah. so, how do you create this? So, this team is coming together for the first time, right? Yeah. So, how do you create that feeling of single team? And, you know, if you s and these teams are c c coming from different organizations as well. So, we have vendors. You know, some of these people sitting in Sydney are from a different organization, servicing the bank. And, you know, we have... Uh, some parts of SDLC, for instance, testing is done by a different vendor here in Bangalore. So, so they are they come from different organizations, yeah. 
but they're all you know sort of trying to do achieve a common goal right so how do you create that feeling of you know one team and we are in this you know together and it's you know it's i think it's a very especially if you have like different locations within your organization and then also have third party vendors it's very complicated right because people f you know ideally they identify with the company they work for and not necessarily with the company that you know hires them to do the work right uh, so but i think it like a tool like this distributed team canvas can be a good start so that at least you have the people who work in one team or maybe two or three teams work on something like this to identify the challenges and speak about it. Right. Because in the end, I think it's all about getting getting some I don't know, top five or top ten issues that you faced, and then agreeing, okay, these are the ten things we're going to do in the next quarter to improve on that. Right. You know? Instead of just saying okay, it doesn't work or it's very complicated, so you need to, and then budgets to get people together help. You know, I heard some sure. other speakers say, okay, just get them in an airplane and it will sure. work, and that's true. But what I have also found is that it works like the week that you spend together, it's all fine. Yeah? And then right. you go back and it's back to zero. <laughs> yeah. sure. So I think you need to try and make it a habit of having good video conferencing stuff and you know, playing with retrospectives, for example. That's sure. also a good, uh, if you do retrospectives well with the whole team, and actually, in theory, every two weeks you'll have an improvement point, and from there you can improve. Yeah? Because sure. both sides, client and vendor, will have the same, same challenges, sure. they'll feel the same. Sure. I hope that helps. Thanks. I'll try that.